director of the Center for African and African American Studies at Southern University of New Orleans. I want to welcome you to this, the first of a four-part series called Africans in the Americas, Cultural Syncretisms and Schisms. This lecture series will explore the unique ways by which elements of traditional African culture have impacted the Americas and vice versa, using historical, ethnographic, economic, and sociological analyses Four scholars will provide an overview of the Caribbean, the Central American countries of Belize and Costa Rica, and South America's Brazil. Because New Orleans represents the cultural northern rim of this region, each speaker will also draw parallels where possible of African cultural continuities and discontinuities between New Orleans and the lower Americas. The implications for contemporary race, class, and gender relations will be discussed. This morning's topic, race relations in Brazil and New Orleans, a comparative analysis is, is provided to us by uh, Dr. Eliana Bennett, who is a research associate at the Newcomb College for Research in Women at Tulane University. Dr. Bennett received her PhD in political science from the University of Southern California. She is not only a scholar, but a, uh, a journalist who has published in the Louisiana Weekly, the Times Picayune, Los Angeles Sentinel, and the Los Angeles Herald Examiner. Uh, Dr. Bennett. Africans living outside of Africa, obviously, are part, are products of the same historical events with variations depending on their respective slavery and colonial systems, okay? This is why with some important differences, which I will mention, uh, New Orleans and Brazil are very similar, quite similar. Most striking in the similarity is the fact that both New Orleans and Brazil suffer from what I call, it's a long thing, post-colonial skin color obsession syndrome. Okay, I, I will talk more about this. Post-colonial skin color obsession syndrome. So it's a disease that both Brazilians and New Orleanians have. And that is, I'm sure, I'm sure all of you are aware of this, and that is, it's that division within the black community which manifests itself in the pathological preference for lighter skin over darker skin. It, it's, it's an obvious component of living in New Orleans, just as it is an obvious component of living in most of Latin America, in fact, not just Brazil. In both New Orleans and Brazil, there, have evolved, there has evolved what I call a buffer class. Creoles in New Orleans, and mulatos in Brazil. The word used in Brazil is mulato, which is just as offensive as the term race, actually more offensive, because mulato comes from uh, people, that term came about to describe people of my color, of mixed ancestry, who are what? The color of a mule, right? So that's where the term mulato comes from. So in both New Orleans and Brazil, you have this buffer class, this economic class in the middle. But before I discuss the similarities and differences in New Orleans and Brazil, let me just give you an overview of the situation in Brazil itself. First of all, uh, and, and I only ask this because American students are, as unfortunately many of you have heard, the, the most unaware of the rest of the world. I mean, high school, American high school graduates have no idea of anything about any other country. I'm sorry, it's true. So, where is Brazil? Yes. <laughs> okay, what else? It, what language is spoken in Brazil? Wow. Yes. Very good. That's amazing. Most Americans will say, oh, you're from Brazil? Como esta, senorita? You know, which is Spanish. So good, I'm impressed. Good, yes. There are three separate Brazils, one white, one brown, and one black. You, you've lived in Brazil, you're, so far she's agreeing with everything, so that's good. <laughs> okay, white Brazil is like white populations uh, in most other countries, 
uh, some are poor, most are middle class, many rich, and some extremely rich. And in general, white Brazilians have access to the necessary resources with which to improve their socioeconomic conditions. Brown Brazil, brown Brazil, mulatos, exist in a social structure very similar to New Orleans, in the middle. Or as sociologist Carl Daigler, his name is up there, and he wrote this book called Neither Black Nor White, which anybody interested in Latin America should look at. Or as he terms it, neither black nor white. It's easier for mulatos in Brazil to move into the mainstream of society than it is for blacks, obviously. And then there is black Brazil, which is a different place entirely from, I'm sure some of you, especially the guys, have seen the typical postcards of asking you to come spend your tourist dollars in Brazil, right, with beautiful naked women and so forth, and the samba and the this and the that. Brazil, black Brazil is very different from that postcard account of Brazil as a racial paradise, which is another term that many social scientists, both Brazilian and Americans, have used to describe Brazil as a racial paradise. Uh, this guy here, his name is this writer, Jorge Amado, who wrote many novels uh, uh, using Brazilian black culture and Brazilian blacks, including the most famous one is called Gabriela Clove. I'm sorry. Gabriela, Clove, and Cinnamon. Uh, Jorge Amado is kind of the Ernest Hemingway of Brazil, uh, an excellent writer, a wonderful writer, racist and sexist. So it's a mixed thing. You enjoy reading his stuff, but you have to be aware that he's racist and sexist, just as Hemingway was. Uh, but Jorge Amado is one of the main producers of this image of Brazil as a racial paradise. Jorge Amado comes from the state where your colleague Luisa is from Brazil here, is from Bahia. So one of the main problems to begin with in understanding black Brazil is that it's very difficult to obtain an accurate estimate of black population in Brazil. For decades, and this is where things begin to get interesting, I don't think you could ever imagine such a thing existing as Americans. Uh, the item color or race was removed from the Brazilian census for decades because the Brazilian government did not want to portray Brazil or to uh, have it known internationally that Brazil is a country with a majority black population. So the item, you know, race, if, if, if you're old enough, any of you have gone through a census in this country, you know that there is this item called race. And well, that item was deleted from the Brazilian census for decades. And even when the item race was there, which is, it now is back, uh, the census takers have no objective parameter. Race in Brazil is recorded according to two things. Number one, and I'll explain this, economic status and the respondent self-description. Okay, what does that mean? Any of you? They've been involved in a census, you know this, I think in the United States also, they come to your house with a form. And uh, in Brazil, the census taker would come to your house, and if you look like me, or if you have any degree of education, or even if you look like many of you in this audience, you are put down as white in the census form. Now, if, if the census taker came to my house and I lived in a slum, of which there are thousands in Brazil, then I would be put down as black. Maybe. In my case, maybe. Because uh, brown co qualifies as, as black, as white. So it's very hard to even get a decent, reliable figure of, of black Brazilians' uh, population in Brazil. Now, recently, race was reinstated into the census as a result of a lawsuit brought about by black activists in Brazil. But, as I said, because of this subjectivity, it's impossible to determine. And also, what they have done now is that they leave blank. This, all uh, Brazilian documents have uh, the space for race, but now their technique is to leave it blank. So, for example, when I 
as I've had children, which I've had a lot of, and I go <laughs> and register them here in the United States in the consulates of Brazil, the, the, uh, the, the line that says race is left blank. And I have to go every time and I have to fight with them. So can you please put, you know, brown? That's what I uh, uh, declare myself and, and my children because that's what we are. No, no, we can't, da, 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 da. so we have big arguments. So my passport uh, says no, no race, race blank, my children's birth certificates in Brazil say race blank, so it's a new race, blank race uh, they have in Brazil. But in any case, according to Brazilian official figures, and if any of you have been to Brazil, you know how absurd this is, uh, Official figures say that 5.10% of the population is black. That's like saying 5% of New Orleans is black. It's absurd. More realistically, and I have put the figures here for you, uh, Brazil really has the largest African population outside of Africa, the African continent, and is the second largest in the world after Nigeria. Uh, the estimates range from 44% of Brazilians are black to 70%, which means that between 60 million and 105 million, 5 million Brazilians are black. Total population in Brazil is over 150 million people right now. So uh, 44 to 70% translates into those figures. Why the lag between esti estimates? Because of what I just explained the way ethnicity is perceived, and also because of another, and this is an interesting comparison to the way you do things in the United States. It's exactly the opposite in Brazil. In the United States, if you have any African ancestry, you're black. In Brazil, if you have any European ancestry, you're white. You understand that? So I'm white because I have Portuguese grandparents in Brazil while in the United States I'm black because I have African grandparents, great grandparents. So it's exactly the opposite. So uh, in, it's possible for a Brazilian black person to become white without going to California, unlike uh, New Orleanians Creoles who have to go to California and pass for white, right? And especially the older, which there's nobody here older, the older Creole New Orleanians, or even you guys might have people in your own family who can tell stories of gra grandparents. You know, somebody moved to California and became white. You don't visit them, right? Well, in Brazil, you don't have to move to California. You can become white just right there, officially. So it's, it's very, very a mess. Brazil is a mess in terms of its racial relations. And it's possible for a non-Brazilian to visit Brazil and think that there is significant integration and interrelation between blacks and whites. The reality, however, is that in spite of the image of racial, racial democracy, is another term people use for Brazil, the reality is that Brazil is the South Africa of Latin America, a country with a majority black population governed and controlled by a minority white population. Racial discrimination is not the law as it is in South Africa, but it is the custom which is a different way to exist. It's not the law, it's against the law, but it is the custom. And this form of discrimination, according to Abidias do Nascimento, the, the bottom name there, as he points out in his work, this form of discrimination where it's not legal, it's not obvious, is the most pernicious and the harder to fight. Because it's, unacknowledged. So an important part of Brazilian racism is the widespread belief in Brazil among whites and blacks that there is no color problem in Brazil. You hear that all the time. American historian John Henry Clark, if any of you have studied his work, he studied Brazil a little bit and he remarks that this lack of consciousness among Brazilian blacks about racism in Brazil is the most tragic part of Brazilian racism for, for the obvious reason that if you're not even aware that you are a part of a caste, uh, you can't even begin to get out of it as has happened in the United States where of course blacks are aware of racism. 
Uh, for example, in Brazil, police beatings, torture, and killing of black men and boys are routine. Any, anybody here been in Brazil uh, besides the two people? Okay, do, do, where did you live in Brazil? In Pará. In Pará. Did, did you uh, witness? Yes. It, it, it is an amazing thing that when you speak to Americans, you, people can't, don't believe. Every time I go to Brazil, without exception, I see the police beating boys and teenage boys on the streets, publicly. Um, Rodney King style, publicly. And people just go by. And it's a common occurrence in Brazil. Common occurrence in Brazil. Correct, Luisa? It happens all the time. And people think it's normal. It's OK. And these acts, of course, go unpunished. And authorities openly defy any public outcry. In fact, when I go to Brazil and I try to engage into any kind of discussion with my friends about uh, racism, they tell, they tell me I've become too Americanized. Oh, Eliana, you, you're full of, uh, and you're too Americanized, and you come here to make trouble. So there's no even the beginning consciousness of this problem. Uh, for example, there are in Brazil over 12 million street children, children who live on the streets. Most of them are black. And there's another figure I want you to remember. Imagine this happening in the United States. I'm sorry. Oh, OK. Um, five, an average of five children are killed per day by the police in Brazil. Five per day. It's an average of 1,800 a year. And this figure is by the United Nations and Amnesty International. This is Brazil. It is not gorgeous, naked women dancing the samba. Brazil is five children a day being killed by the police, tortured, and so forth, uh, according to international, more objective uh, fig uh, organizations. And 70% of the street children are black. And 80% of the ones that are killed are black. OK, and this is. It goes unpunished. It's considered to be part of the normal, much like in the Old South, long time ago, right? You've all seen movies and read accounts. That's the way things are. There's nothing you can do, and it's accepted. OK, so much as in the United States, the black underclass of Brazil had its beginnings in the so-called emancipation. Slaves were cast into a freedom without employment, without housing, without any social political structure with which to enter mainstream stream society. And in the early 1900s, as Brazil started to industrialize more heavily, there was a, an official program, what they called to whiten Brazil, in which the government actually and actively went to Europe and recruited uh, European immigrants, uh, mostly Germans, um, English, a lot of the south of Brazil is populated by Germans and English, <coughs> English people. Instead of uh, using the labor pool available of newly freed blacks, the, Ameri the Brazilian government wanted to uh, officially had a thing where they said that they wanted a people of a superior ethnic <coughs> stock. And so they went to Europe and brought in uh, immigrants from Europe rather than uh, appropriate the labor of Brazilian blacks. And this went on through the government of Getúlio Vargas, which is in the second uh, column there. Uh, he's kind of he's, uh, considered the populist president, famous president in Brazil. He initiated a lot of labor reforms and so forth. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, in his government, he, he had this policy of whitening the country and actively pursued um, white immigrants from Europe to come to Brazil. And as a part of this whitening policy, most records pertaining to slavery, slave trade, and the life of Africans in Brazil, the records were burned. In, many, in the state of Bahia, for example, many of the records were just burned. And so it's very difficult to, uh, for us to learn about our own history. And of course, the history of Africans in Brazil is excluded uh, from school curricula. And the practice of African religion in Brazil was until recently forbidden by law. 
even though most Brazilians practice it, and I'll talk about that in, in a minute. And during the military government, which is still in power but with a, a civilian front, it was written into law that it was a threat to national security to speak of racism in Brazil. In other words, black people who wanted to talk about their conditions were often imprisoned because it was against the law. It was a threat to national security. So as I mentioned earlier, perhaps the greatest problem in Brazilian racism is the lack of consciousness of racism among African Brazilians. Uh, and both Abidias do Nascimento and uh, John Henry Clark have talked about this. Um, but there have been some pockets of an African Brazilian movement, mostly started by Abidias do Nascimento, my friend, and who's now in his early 80s and uh, was the founder of, over there on the three, column three, no, column two still, uh, the Frente Negra Brasileira, which was it's, uh, the Black Brazilian Front in the 1930s, and that was outlawed in 1937 by Getulio Vargas, the populist president. Abidias also founded the Teatro Experimental do Negro, which is the Black Experimental Theater. May, some of you may have seen, and if you haven't, go and, and rent on a Friday night from the, a video store, Black Orpheus, a movie, Black Orpheus, a wonderful movie, considered to be one of the very first movies done about black people. It was done by a French filmmaker in Brazil. And uh, the two main actresses of Black Orpheus, their names are Lea Garcia and Ruth de Souza, come out of the Teatro Experimental do Negro, the Black Experimental Theater, which was a, a, the, a theatrical, um, workshop that took household workers and gave them the training as actresses, people who had talent already in that direction, and offered them the opportunity. And two of the great Brazilian actresses are out of this, um, out of this, this theater. But slowly over the last 50 years, some organizations have come up that try to deal with racism in Brazil, most notably the National Brazilian Union of Black Women, a very powerful union, which was Lea Garcia, the actress, was the founding uh, president of that. So the myth of Brazilian uh, racial democracy is just that. It is a myth that serves the international purpose of portraying Brazil as a racial paradise, as well as the national purpose within Brazil of creating and I put that term there, I, I, I hope you remember this, creating what's called by social scientists false consciousness. Okay, what I want to just for a minute before I go, I, now I'm going to talk about the specific similarities between New Orleans and Brazil, but false consciousness, what's that? That is when people perceive their conditions within a society in a false way. They have been taught, as in the case of Brazil, Blacks are not aware that the reason they are at the bottom of society is because of racism. They, they have been taught that it's the way things are. You know, it's, um, it's the way things ought to be. Uh, there, there are some comparable myths uh, in the United States. For example, the notion that if you work hard enough, you can make it. Well, that's a myth, and it's also a called false consciousness, because in fact, in the United States, when you fail to make it, then most of us tend to blame ourselves, right? We didn't work hard enough, we didn't, da, da, da. well, when it, and in many, of course that happens, but in general, when you talk in social terms, uh, the fact is that it's not true, that if you work hard enough, you make it in this country. There are other, other factors that play into it. Uh, false consciousness comes about, you are actually, it's political indoctrination. What is the first thing that you guys do when you start kindergarten? What do you start doing and then you finish, you only not do it after high school. So for 12 years you do it every morning and you become embroiled in false consciousness. What is it? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Uh, what does it go? And with, for which it stands, one nation, oh, under God, with liberty and justice for all. So my daughter is now in kindergarten, not that one, a three-year-old, not in kindergarten, it's in preschool, three years old. 
and she has learned this thing. And it's so cute when she says it. And when I look at her, it is, of course, we have to teach her. But uh, imagine this little kid, you know, as all of you, with liberty and justice for all. That's heavy. That's really an amazing piece of um, building false consciousness. So I taught, she, poor thing, she's three years old, and I taught her to say, uh, what did I say? I said, with liberty and injustice for all. So her teacher didn't like that. <laughs> okay. So this is, this is kind of a, uh, an overview of Brazil. And now I want to talk just specifically about some of the similarities. The most obvious similarity between Brazil and New Orleans is on column three, the escape hatch, okay, what social scientists call the Creole mulatto escape hatch. What is that? That is that class in the middle to which you can escape the condition of being black in New Orleans and in Brazil. Not in the rest of the country, but in New Orleans you can. Physically, that is economically, uh, in Brazil and in New Orleans, one becomes, well in Brazil, you become white, as I mentioned, to the extent that you acquire money and education. And in New Orleans, of course, although you remain black, officially, but there is, you also, if you're a Creole, that is, if you have light brown skin, then you're in that buffer class. I mean, you uh, will have better opportunities to get into the so-called better schools, to get a job, and so forth, and so on. To be elected into office, you know, look at what one of, some of your classes might assign this to you. Do a chart and see how many African, less mixed persons you have in office in, in New Orleans. Now, the Creoles, um, and I remember the last uh, election in 88, uh, one of, someone my husband knows has a barber shop in New Orleans, and barber shops are great places to uh, learn about the culture and learn about what's going on, because people go there, especially in a place like New Orleans, to talk and spend time not just cutting their hair. And I remember, uh, this is a Creole barber shop owned by this Creole man, and he, we got in, uh, into a conversation, and he told me, he said that he, it was Jefferson running for mayor, right? Wasn't it William Jefferson? Against uh, uh, Bartholomew. And so, and his customers, both black and Creole, in the midst of talking in the barbershop, would say that they were not voting for Jefferson because he was d dark skin. And it's a piece of New Orleans life, you know? It's, it's an interesting way to try to understand the, the political structure of the city. The second way that this escape hatch works is psychologically. In Brazil and New Orleans, Creoles and mulatos can carve out this psychological place for themselves where they can imagine that they are better than blacks. That happens in New Orleans, that happens in Brazil. The second similarity historically also between New Orleans and Brazil is the sexual attack, physical and psychological, on African women, which has produced this population of Creoles and mulatos in Brazil and New Orleans. In both Brazil and New Orleans, people of mixed ancestry are usually very proud and very quick to want to tell you about their European ancestry. The, um, the recent series that the Times Picayune did a few months ago on, on race relations in Brazil, many of the Creoles, you know, making a big deal about their French great, 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 great somebody. Oh, out of the ordinary, you know, very proud of that. When in fact, the fact is that uh, this, both populations in Brazil and in New Orleans of Creoles and mulatos come out of uh, the rape, at worst, and concubination, at best, of black women, where European men and African women were really not in an equal relationship, but the African women were exploited, either raped outright or forced into a position of becoming concubines in order to survive, and that is both in Brazil and New Orleans, that's the case. Uh, and this relationship in both New Orleans and Brazil becomes romanticized. You know, you have this romance 
about the Creole woman with the, Af with the European man. And you have this romance about the mulata who is so sexy and so sensual with the Portuguese man. And this romance becomes part of the way we face relations in Brazil and in New Orleans. Okay, it's somehow a source of pride you know, that, that we had a great, great grandmother who was so sexy that was desirable to uh, a Portuguese or a French man. Okay? So this is another similarity, is that in New Orleans and in, in Brazil, you have this romance with slavery, to use the term by another American anthropologist who has studied Brazil, a romance with slavery. You know, one of the things that was most shocking to me when I came here as a non-American to learn in New Orleans, when you go to visit plantations, you know, instead of the plantations outside of New Orleans, being historical monuments. Of course, you have to preserve them and you have to understand what happened. But instead of them being places where, like the Jews, go back to the concentration camps to understand the horror, they don't go there to do tourism. And they certainly don't get married in them. Like there is a plantation thing on Hain Boulevard. And I cannot, for the life of me, understand why a black person would want to get married in that. And it's a status symbol in the Creole society to get married in that place. It's called what? Southern what? Southern Can you imagine a Jewish person getting married in Auschwitz? No. No. And so you go to visit the plantations here, and it's glorified how wonderful it was, and uh, really part of false consciousness. And then you have people, black people, getting married in a plantation. To me, is an incredible irony. It's an incredible lack of consciousness. OK. Uh, another similarity, of course, is the experience of diaspora. The word diaspora means the uh, scattering throughout the world of Africans uh, through slavery. And this experience becomes, for us, both in Brazil and in New Orleans, becomes the most or one of the most important parts of our lives. I mean, we are, probably most of us are kind of controlled by the fact that we are black and brown, right? It, it influences our jobs or lack of jobs, our education that we're going to get, and so forth. So this is a contradiction in both of our lives, in New Orleans and in Brazil. And then there's another thing which is very New Orleans and very Brazilian, marrying light and marrying white, right? That's a New Orleans thing. When I came here to teach at Xavier University, my students would tell me stories, not only about their parents' generation, in which, uh, and then I learned this term, the, it was called the brown paper bag test in their parents' generation, where if they brought home a date light, darker than a brown paper bag, it was heart attack time, right? You're grounded forever. Never again go out, cannot go out. And the same thing in Brazil, same thing. You marry lighter and whiter in order to gain access into the society. It's a helpful thing to be married to somebody lighter than you. It will get you a better job. Both, both places. It's true. It's the truth. It happens in both places. And one thing, I won't mention who, but I thought it was so funny. One of the candidates last Sunday had a, uh, had a flyer inside the Times-Picayune with a huge picture of himself and his wife. And it was funny. It was interesting. I wonder, I wonder if you know, that was one of the reasons also as a, you know, to, to convince people, look, I'm married to somebody light skin and cute. <laughs> So this happens in Brazil. In fact, in Brazil, it is uh, considered a step up for you to marry. Somebody, I, I, I like to imagine that that's not why my parents were married, but uh, who knows? I like, to, I like to imagine that I was a product of a loving relationship. But the fact is that my father was a professional politician, scholar, and he married a white person common in Brazil. It's very uncommon to see black people marry black, other black people when they have education and so forth. And then the final 
similarity is that in both New Orleans and Brazil, Creoles and mulatos who become politicians, who ascend, and I don't mean just elected officials, but any kind of in the city structures, in both places, these people separate themselves from the black populations. That is, they do not have a relationship with them, they do nothing for them, and to the extent that Creoles and mulatos occupy places in the political structure of both places, the conditions of the black community deteriorates. Both places. You can look, you can see it in New Orleans, where you have a Creole political structure and you have the black community uh, in worse situation than it was 10 years ago in many ways. The school system, the housing, jobs, so forth. And the same is in Brazil. Okay, a couple of differences. The major difference between New Orleans and Brazil is that the African culture is present in Brazil to a greater extent than it is in New Orleans. And that is the best explanation. There are many, but I, for me, I think that the best explanation is that the way in which the Portuguese and the French and English bought their slaves was different. The Portuguese tended to buy their slaves in lots and keep them together which meant what? That they kept their language and their customs and could communicate with each other. Whereas in, in America, in Northern America, North America, the, uh, uh, the tendency was to buy slaves individually and to consciously separate them. So uh, languages disappeared as did religious and other customs. Now, many social scientists, both in Brazil and in the United States, like to say that that's because the Portuguese were so much nicer. Of course, that's not true. There's no such thing as a benevolent slavery, but that term has been used. You know, well, the Portuguese, no, they didn't, it was just a different business strategy, which, um, you know, I haven't read a lot about what the rationale is, but it was a business strategy. They felt that the, the slaves would survive better if they were not separated from their parents and so forth and so on. It was a business decision. It wasn't because Portuguese were better and nicer people than the, the French or the English. The second difference is, the, as I mentioned, the lack of awareness in Brazil of the race problem. Blacks in Brazil are still what I call driving Miss Daisy. Blacks in Brazil are driving Miss Daisy. That is, they see themselves as having a place in society, if, you, if any of you had, saw that movie. Uh, and Brazilian whites are Miss Daisy. They have no clue that there is such a thing as racism, and they see as a natural thing, the place of people. Everybody has their place, and you don't cross those places. You know. And I'll just tell you a funny story. Just recently, uh, well, a few months ago, we came back to New Orleans, and a um, uh, maintenance man who, who, works, who worked around where we lived uh, wrote me a love letter. It was an amazing thing, because I had just had a baby. I was not very attractive at all. And I gave the letter to my, my husband, and, and we went and talked to him, because I was afraid of him. He was, my husband was gone all day, and the guy was... Uh, you know, knew my, where I was alone at home and so forth. So my husband and I confronted him and he said, I'm sorry, da, 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 da. But I told my mother about this. My mother is Brazilian and white, as I've mentioned. And it, her, 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 her outrage, and this is so Brazilian, this is why I'm saying, her outrage was not that this man had been scary to me or something, but that he was from a lower class. So I guess, you know, if, if somebody rich and white wrote me a, a nasty note, she'd, she wouldn't think it was anything wrong. But her, her, her biggest outrage was that he was from a low, how dare he you know, cross that boundary and, and, and talk to me, right? Very Brazilian. So as I said, this is not to say that you in the United States don't have your myths. You do. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the myth of if you can work hard enough, you can make it, and it's a democracy, and all of those myths. Uh, but in Brazil, it, it's ha even harder to get at them. And another uh, difference is, I, as I mentioned earlier, the birth certificates are related to skin tone rather than, than, than ethnicity. 
Uh, my birth certificate, for example, says that I'm white. The famous uh, soccer player, Pelé, most of you have heard of, he's uh, very African looking. He married a white person, and he was very proud and announced publicly that he was so happy to be able to register his children as white. Um, you know, very typically Brazilian. So, um, you know, in Brazil, as I mentioned, if you are, if you have European ancestry, you are white. If you have African ancestry, you are black. And uh, the last di difference is that the what you call, and I don't like this word, voodoo in New Orleans, and candomblé, which I didn't write down, candomblé in Brazil is the African religion in Brazil. In New Orleans today, voodoo is just a tourist attraction. It has died precisely because of people could not relate to each other and, and keep it alive. Whereas in Brazil, candomblé is a live religion and practiced by most Brazilians. And in fact, in Brazil, we have, uh, in Brazil people practice candomblé along with Catholicism, which is another lecture. It's very interesting uh, syncretism that they use. But we have a saying in Brazil, uh, and when I came for my interview at Xavier here, when I uh, came to teach here, before I got the job, they asked me, what's my religion? And I was in a bad mood, nasty mood, and I, I was me. And I said, uh, I decided to be s satirical, and I said to them, which is the truth in Brazil, if everything is going well, we're Catholics. But when we need some serious help, we go back to Candomblé. So we know we don't have any problems. You go to church every Sunday, and things are okay. But when, things, when you need some serious help, we go back to our old practices of, you know, lots of things that we do. And I said that, and they were like, uh, so this is a brief analysis of some of the comparisons and differences between New Orleans and Brazil. A final similarity is that in both New Orleans and Brazil, the uninformed person can be fooled by the appearance of inter-ethnic uh, relation and cooperation, which is promoted in great part by this buffer class in New Orleans, the Creoles, and in, in Brazil the mulatos. And I've left about five minutes if you have any questions. Yes, Dr. Hollis. At least historically, most of the uh, buffer class, the Creole of color class you're talking about is Catholic, whereas many of the more African people here, uh, appearing people are uh, Protestant. I wish you'd come in on that. Yes, thank you very much. That's. Uh, I know you guys have to leave, but I had, I had left this out because of time, but I, this is a very important uh, similarity. Yes, it is not coincidental that Brazil and New, or that New Orleans is in the United States uh, uh, differently from the rest of the United States, colonized in the Catholic religion. Catholicism has some specific, uh, has had some specific results which are similar in Brazil and in New Orleans. Number one, the notion of hierarchy. In the Catholic religion, there is this notion of hierarchy, right? You speak to God through the priest, the bishop, the this and that, and the pope. And the pope is infallible, and the rest of the people are just little meaningless uh, members of the religion. Whereas in Protestant uh, religions, there is a tendency, it's not so all the time, of course, but there's a tendency that you speak to God Directly, and so the notion of hierarchy is differently different, and this is uh, reflect, reflected in 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 the in the notion of uh, in in the race race relations. So there was this notion of hierarchy rather than the more democratic myth in the rest of the United States. Not saying that this is what happens, but at least there is a mythology which in New Orleans and Brazil is missing. In New Orleans and Brazil, there is definitely this hierarchy which. Uh, I think comes from, in part, not all of it, but in part from the legacy of Catholic colonization, as well as the notion of appearance, also important in the Catholic religion, right? If you appear, not doctrine, I'm not saying that it's, it's a written doctrine, of course it's not, but in the way in which Catholicism has been practiced is, throughout the world, is that it, if you have the appearance of being a good person, right? If you have the appearance of behaving properly, that's often more important than if it's really true. And again, it's reflected in, in uh, New Orleans politics as it is in Brazil. You know, the Brazilian president can have 
20 mistresses as long as he does it discreetly. In New Orleans, uh, New Orleans politician, the same. You can have you know, your extra things discreetly. Don't make it, you know, don't have it go public. But, you know, it's a Catholic thing that you, you have to appear to be purer than uh, you really are. So yes, one of the correlations between the similarities in, uh, between New Orleans and Brazil seems to be a Catholic, the Catholic colonization. Any other questions? Yes. yes um, I would like for you, oh, I would like to ask you if you can make the relationship between like the Mardi Gras Indians and the African culture with, uh, with Bahia. Right. And, uh, Recife, uh, right. in that area, yeah. Well, it's the same festival. It's the same, uh, celebrating the same time. It's tied to the Catholic uh, 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 Lent and so forth and so on. Uh, it's just manifested differently. In, in New Orleans, you have a more European influence of the Mardi Gras or the Carnival as in the Italian thing. Uh, and in Brazil, of course, you, it, it was kind of taken over by African customs. So the carnival in Brazil is uh, all about dance and the streets. And it's less and less. It's become much more uh, tourist-oriented and excludes the people now, unfortunately. But even now, it used to be more, but even today, uh, the best part of carnival in Brazil is, is street dancing. I mean, you go out and you really dance on the streets, and there's music. There's uh, like the Indians, like the, the the Mardi Gras Indians in New Orleans. That kind, that's my favorite thing in New Orleans. My husband uh, thinks I'm wild and crazy. Doesn't like to take me, but I nag him every year, make him take me to the to the see the Indians because it's it's very much like that in Brazil. It's the way the uh, people just spontaneously just form in the streets, and people follow people. That with, they have the drums and the dancing on the streets. So it's a definite connection, being that in Brazil it's a more African uh, form of celebration. Yes. Um, uh, I want to ask a little bit more about the other form of religion you said that you have in contrast to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And um, could you give us some similarities between that and the voodoo that's down here? Yeah. Well, the African religion in Brazil, there's two, two main names for it. It's candomblé or macumba. And uh, the, the main notion is that there are many gods there's not one god, but there are many gods. Uh, Eshu, Ogun, Yemanja are my favorites. Yemanja, uh, for women, those of you, you might look up in the, your library here. Uh, Yemanja is the goddess of the waters. She uh, is uh, particularly interesting for women. It's the goddess of uh, nurturing and so forth. And so that's one of the main, main differences between the Catholic, it's, it's many gods that are in charge of different uh, areas of human existence. Uh, now the rituals are totally different. The rituals of uh, Candomblé are of course uh, very musical, dance. Um, the uh, the an animal uh, ritual thing that the media likes to exploit so much, it, it happens but it's not at all even Predominant. It is. A, it's a minor part of some of the celebrants. Um, uh, you do a lot of things at home, in 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 the candomblé. You have. You can have candles. You can have an altar in your own home, with, uh, for example, water from the ocean or water for la If you don't have the ocean, you can go to Lake Poncha Train. Yemanja will will uh, protect you just as well. She'll, she'll be sorry for the pollution, but. You can have an altar at home. Um, yesterday was Yamanja's day. And uh, any, any candomblé, I hope you, you went to Lake Ponchon Train and threw some flowers. Uh, otherwise, you have a bad year. And um, uh, so it's a very rich religion. And you have priests and priest priestesses who are initiated, who you learn, much like in any other religion, you go through many years of training, and then you become an, an initiate into the lower levels of, of being a, priest, a priestess or a priest. Um, so that's, 
It's just kind of an overview of it. The most important thing, I think, is there are different gods and deities to which you can appeal for different areas of your, of your existence. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Oh, she's asking me. I, I'll translate. She's asking me if I don't think Brazil needs me. Yeah, I agree. I would like to go back. Brazil is, uh, her question was, w should I not go back to Brazil? And my, yes, I've tried, and uh, the economic system is very impossible there. And unless you are much like in New Orleans, unless you are, you are a crook, you cannot function in politics, which is what I love. So uh, very hard to make a living there. And yes, we pl we're planning to go back eventually, as soon as we, one of us can get a job that we'll, we can survive from. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Dr. Bennett again.